Koppel, host of the Time for Coffee podcast, where you get firsthand career advice into the jobs and industries that interest you the most. And before we start today's show, I have a quick favor to ask you. If you haven't already, I'd be incredibly grateful if you give us a rating and a review on iTunes. And if you're like me, you need to do it now because you'll forget later and because it's the best way to help others who may be in search of career advice to find this free resource. So press pause if you haven't done it and do it right now. I'll wait. Thanks so much and enjoy today's show. Hey there, Java junkies. Welcome back to another episode of T4C. If you want to learn more about what it's like to be a young journalist who logged years at NPR and CNN before facing a major life challenge and how he navigated that challenge to pivot into an entirely new career he DIY, then this is the episode for you. Because my next guest is an entrepreneur, former CNN and NPR award-winning journalist who unexpectedly became the leading global expert on modern fathers in the workplace. But before I introduce you to Josh Lebs, I want to make sure you've signed up for the Java Junkies Journal. That's T4C's newsletter that features unique firsthand career insights and advice into dozens of different industries from the professionals like Josh who are actually working in them. Just head over to the Time for Coffee website at time, the number four, coffee.org, and the sign up box is right there. Now, my Java lovers, please grab your mug and take a chug of your favorite caffeinated brew because it's time for another caffeinated career conversation. And my guest is Josh Lebs, an entrepreneur, motivational speaker, and the leading global expert on modern fathers in the workplace. Today, Josh leads workshops and consults with major corporations on how to build stronger workplace cultures by increasing inclusion, diversity, opportunity, and respect while trying to get rid of unconscious bias. The inspiration behind Josh's workshops and his consulting was his 2015 award-winning book, All In, How Our Work First Culture fails dads, families, and businesses, and how we can fix it together. The UN named Josh a global champion of gender equality, while the Financial Times named him one of the world's top 10 male feminists. A New York Times front page story declared him to be a pioneer. Prior to stepping out on his own, Josh spent 20 years reporting for NPR and CNN, where he developed unique expertise on nonpartisan fact checking. In fact, at CNN, Josh was called the truth seeker in chief, Mr. Reality and senior everything correspondent. He also created a new beat for himself in which he reported on modern families. And as a result of doing that, developed an expertise in what it's really like to be a dad in the 21st century. There is a lot more to Josh's story, but I'm going to let him tell it in just a little bit. Josh, welcome to Time for Coffee. Are you caffeinated and ready to go? I am both. And thank you for one of the best introductions ever. (laughs) It's fantastic. Well, that is saying a lot. And secondly, I have a, I don't know, I have a little skepticism about that because I think you've probably had some phenomenal introductions over the years, Josh. I just want our listeners to know that I think you and I became friends when you were 20 something. Could that be right? Or were you in your early 30s? You were a young I guy. I would have been my yeah, early 30s, very early 30s, because this was before I even went on air at CNN. So I had just, yeah, I was just barely over 30, I think, when you and I got to know each other. Um, man, we've been through some stuff. We've been through some stuff. And back then, I don't know if he still is, but back then, Josh and his lovely wife, Melanie, were crispy cream pushers. In fact, they are the people who first introduced me 
to the unbelievable sugar rush known mm. as a Krispy Kreme donut right out of the oven. And I don't even like sweets, but when you go to Krispy Kreme and you see the Hot Donuts Now sign, whatever you're doing, you just have to stop and pull in. Oh my God. That was, and actually, Josh, I'm just remembering this. I was pregnant with yes. my one and only child, Aiden. Mm-hmm. And I think that's probably why Aiden likes sugar so much because I ate so many sweets. And honestly, I didn't really eat that many sweets before, but yeah. now we know the whole neonatal thing. Anyway, I'm totally boring our listeners no, who could great. care less oh my about God. my pregnancy <laughs> and my early Krispy Kreme addiction. And no, they actually, I, what, go one ahead. quick thing about your pregnancy, you were the only pregnant woman in all of history who had to make sure not to enter a nuclear reactor in Libya. I remember thinking, okay, that's a basic from the doctor. Don't stand too close to a microwave. Don't drink too much coffee. Don't enter a nuclear reactor in Libya when you're pregnant. You're when, you're pregnant. when you're eight yes, months pregnant, when you're eight months pregnant, pregnant which yeah. you and Melanie didn't have children at that point. And I right. think now you can fully appreciate how fucking insane I was. <laughs> it's incredible that you even got close. I mean, looking back. I mean, but the fact that I went to Libya. You went to Libya. No, that's what I mean. The fact that you were traveling at eight months. I mean, especially given that a couple of my kids ended up being premature. <laughs> right. <laughs> and actually, Aiden was 37 weeks. I know not as early as oh, yours. Okay. Yeah. But look, when- I totally don't want to lose any okay. more of our listeners at this point, Josh, yeah. because they may be wondering why it's relevant for them. Right. Those who are still in school right now, or maybe those who've just graduated at this stage of their student life or their professional life to listen to a story, to listen to an interview of a former journalist. And I know you still do journalism, who is today an expert on gender equality in the workplace. And I totally get that because honestly, at their age, I wasn't thinking about what it was going to be like to be a mother at age 22 or 23. And I certainly wasn't thinking about what it would be like to balance motherhood and work life. And I wish someone had spoken to me about this at that point, about what it's like to juggle both. What about you? Was this something you were thinking about? Um, No, not at that age. You know, I'll tell you, listening to two things right now. One, you can create your entire career, which you and I will talk about. And it's a whole different way to approach a career. And that's what I'm doing now, something I created. But also, in terms of gender equality, I say this in my speeches that when I was in college, the way all of us spoke about our futures, it was on an assumption that we would be able to have careers and families. And now is the time for you to learn that the workplace has not updated the way the society has. Workplaces will still push you, if you're female, to do the caregiving. will push you, if you're male, to not do the caregiving. And going to work for a place in which that's changing will benefit you. So you want to have your eyes open well before you ever have kids or anyone that you need to take care of. And I will share some tips with you during this conversation about how to spot a place that will make sure that you can have those options in your future. And I speak at tons of colleges and grad schools all the time. So I know this is important information for uh, your cohort. Awesome. So before we get into how you became a gender rights activist and a leading voice for modern dads at work, let's flash back, Josh. Josh Lebs, this is your life. You went to Yale University where you majored in Comparative literature in comp lit. Did you know what you were going to do with that major when you graduated way back in 1994? I, so you had to choose a major in college. I had a feeling back then that I would never need that major for anything. And among the students, I was kind of known for being the lit major who never read the books. I just didn't have time. I was doing journalism. I was doing all these projects. I was so involved in things. I chose comp lit because It was the only way to take multiple classes taught in different languages. So at the time, I spoke Spanish and Italian. I was learning some Hebrew. I wanted to take classes that were taught in different languages. And by doing that, quote unquote, comparative literature, where you're studying literature in different languages, I could sit there in class and converse in those languages. So that's why I did it. I had a feeling the languages would be helpful eventually. 
But no, my only focus really was to uh, get the best experiences that I could in college, whether it was through classes or outside of classes, and then to take those experiences with me. But did you know at all Mm. what career you might want to pursue? Yes, I knew in my head that I was going to pursue broadcasting. I didn't tell anyone. And at Yale, there was no TV station. There were some newspapers and stuff. I did some magazines and writing. I knew I wanted to do broadcasting. And so I knew that learning to be a good communicator in general would be really important. So languages helped because they got me thinking about communication. I spent part of my summer, one summer at Gallaudet University in Washington, learning basic sign language because I wanted to learn a whole different way to communicate. So I knew in my head that the more I learned about communications, the more I'd be able to apply those skills to broadcasting. But there were no broadcasting classes at Yale. didn't exist. So I was just like, let's keep the skills and I'll find a way to use these later on. Beautiful. So you mentioned all the other things that you were involved in. Could you share what they were, the extracurriculars, maybe internships, part-time or full-time jobs, whatever it was that you were involved in as an undergrad? And do you think in hindsight, any of them actually helped prepare you for the working world? And if so, how? Sure. So some of them did. I mean, I was doing uh, writing for a bunch of magazines there, which meant I would also conduct interviews, sometimes with famous people who would come to campus to give speeches. So there was that. Yale happens to be a very drama-based school. You know, there's tons of actors there. It's, it's where like all these professional actors who are child actors are also going to school and taking the train between New York and New Haven every day. So since there's so much drama there, I did take part in something called children's theater, where we would go off into the community and help kids learn to communicate through theater. And so I learned those skills as well. And then I wrote the book for a musical. And because there's all these talented people at Yale, I had all these people write the music. Some of whom are now off like writing the music for the most successful movies and TV shows and Broadway shows in America. Wow. So, you know, I was spoiled with the talent that I was around. So I wrote a children's musical. I wrote the book. And then, so I had that experience and then we brought it, we performed it and then we brought it into the community. And what so was it called? Had, uh, it was called Inside Out. And it was barely tangentially representative of environmental issues, but not in a clobber or you're over the head kind of way. It was about using the imagination and a lock in the imagination. And I was able to see what it's like to create and have an idea and then bring it all the way to fruition. So we went from, you know, this concept in my head to a musical that was being performed that spring and going into the community to I got a call from the children's something at the Kennedy Center asking about possibility. So I was able to see what it's like to go from zero to 100 and put in all that work and also deal with egos because when you're dealing with actors, you're dealing with, I was directing. So there was a lot that I learned from that. And really, you know, the more and more that I work in different types of companies these days, the more I see that your ability to communicate with people on terms that work best for them will benefit you in any career. So everything it took to get the writers for the music, to organize, bring into community, to get the physical space, to direct, to get the musicians, everything it took to make that happen I still apply to this day. So in that sense, those interpersonal skills, those are crucial. Amazing. So what was your first job after you graduated, Josh? And how did you get it? So I am different this way. I have this very deep relationship with my instincts. And I just had this realization one day, oh, I'm going to move to Atlanta after college. I knew no one in Atlanta. I knew the Olympics were going to be happening in Atlanta. And I knew that therefore there would be opportunity. So I was just like, I'm going to just take off and move to Atlanta with nothing. But I knew I wanted to go into broadcasting. So I got some jobs that were part-time. I was selling tickets at a comedy club, worked for a few months using my languages to help the Olympics. But then my first real job was that I knew I wanted to break in. I decided I wanted to break in at NPR. So I showed up at the local public radio station during a pledge drive. And I said, I will volunteer. I'll take out the trash. Like, I just want to hang out around here. So they started letting me be a fixture around there while I was still paying the bills by doing those other things. And after several months, I found an opportunity to do something on air. 
And then they gave me a shot. They heard it. They said, oh, you don't suck at this. You're actually okay at this. All right. And they said, feel free to do more of these. And they thought I might do one a month, but instead I started doing like five reports a day. So boom, bam, boom, I'm on the air every day. That's my first job, my first career, my first everything. This is Cups and Ice. Yes. (laughs) Yes. Yeah, this is... You want me to go into Cups and Ice? I do. (laughs) Okay. So I ended up giving a TEDx talk years later about this. But the idea is that you can take what sounds like a tiny opportunity and turn it into something huge. And people don't realize this. And the example that I use is from this TV show, Friends, which this young generation knows now because you're watching it on HBO. Anyway, it's the best example of this. There's this episode where Phoebe wants to help give a party throw a, par- a birthday party, but Monica won't let her help. And Phoebe really wants to. And Monica finally says, okay, fine, you can be in charge of cups and ice, which sounds like it's nothing. Like most people would just pick up the cups and ice. But Phoebe turns the entire party into cups and ice. People are wearing cups as hats. There's every kind of ice. There's shaved ice and dry ice. And they have snow cones. Everything about the party is cups and ice. And so what I did in my career was that I cups and iced it. When they said, go ahead and do this more, they didn't say only once a month. They just said, do it more. So I started working around the clock. I was on the air constantly. I went on the air right before I turned 24. And two months later, I started with the network. I just called the folks in Washington. I said, I'm on the air here in Atlanta. Can I help? And they said, okay. And then by a month after that, I was doing reports for the network regularly. And a couple months after that, I was only doing reports for the network. So I was doing all national reporting that same year. So I had you know, gone from taking out the trash and volunteering for months and months and months to finding an opportunity to boom, cups and icing it and creating a career. And then they had to pay me. They had to hire me because I was doing relevant work to them. It's such an incredible example. And it reminds me of another professional I interviewed, a number of them, the ones who have the grit and listen to their intuition, as you did, Josh, who decide, I'm going to do this and I'm not going to take no for an answer. And it's not that you have to be obnoxious. This guy, MK Alhasami, who graduated from college just after 9-11 and his first name is Muhammad. Mm. Needless to say, it was a little hard for him to get a job. He decided he wanted to go into real estate. He was also in Atlanta and there was a very well-known and I don't remember his name. He's since deceased realtor, commercial guru who is Jewish living in Atlanta. And Muhammad decided he wanted to work with this guy. So he proceeded to show up every single day as soon as the office opened. And he asked for a few minutes of time with this gentleman. And he did that for an entire week. And he stayed in the office all day long, all day long. Mm -hmm. And he finally got five minutes. The man became his mentor. Mohammed is now a hugely successful real estate guy living in the Middle East. So Wow. It is possible to cups and ice it, but I don't think a lot of people have that. They don't want to be rude. Right. They don't want to be rude. And also, no one's ever taught them to stop and realize that a small opportunity can be a huge one. You know, some of us have heard this line about like having a small, there are no small parts, just small actors. The idea that you can do a lot with a couple lines in a movie. Like Marilyn Monroe started her career with, I think, one line in a movie, some walk around. But What they don't realize is that in most types of jobs, if you go by exactly what the person says, you can realize that it's much bigger than it sounded. And you can take anything, any little project that you're given. Like, you know, if someone as an intern or as a new low level employee, if you're given one task and you nail it and you get credit for it and you share it with others and they point out, look what a great job this person did. There's so many ways to do that. I I will say also that. I had some, and a lot of graduating college students too, I think I had some hubris going into it that I thought I would be better at it at first than I was, which is why probably the number one smartest thing I did was I chose to work with the hardest editors at NPR. I was like, I asked people, who are the toughest editors? And those are the ones I pitched to. And they, in the early days, would have me redo my scripts two or three times. Because I was like, I don't just want to do this. I want to learn how to do it well. Have a vertical learning curve. Learn, learn, learn. So this Mohammed person probably had a lot to learn from this man's mentor. Work really hard to learn. Don't assume that you already know how to do it great. Trust your instincts that it's the right field for you. But focus on learning from people around you who are successful 
in a real modest way, in a way that sets aside a humility and allows yourself like soak up these lessons. And it was only because I worked extra hours to improve every line that I got to a place where a year later, they could trust me as an NPR correspondent and give me the toughest stories. So, you know, don't just get yourself the opportunity. Also make sure that when you have it, you know how to do it. And you work your ass off. Work your ass off. You have to operate on the assumption that you will get an opportunity and start learning, learning, learning. Because otherwise you get the opportunity and then you suck at it. And then there goes that entire experience. Yeah. So during this time, around this same time, you were at NPR for 10 years and you actually, you won at least one Peabody. Is that correct? Well, actually, the Peabody, I got a bunch of Peabody's at, at CNN, but at NPR, I got these two Moreau Awards. Oh, gosh. Yes, that's what it was. Yes. Edward R. Murrow, which is, that's a phenomenal accomplishment. And you got two. Actually, yeah, that's an imp- important story for college students, too. Because like, it, because what happened with the Moreaus was really instructive. Do you want me to share that? To, sure. They were, so, uh, so what happened was, this was at the point, I, I was winning a whole like, bunch of awards. I was very fortunate. I won... AP Awards and National Association of Black Journalists and Society of Professional Journalists. I was getting a ton of awards and that was great. But then several years later, when I wanted to go on air on CNN, I wasn't getting that opportunity at first. And then I had this idea when Hurricane Katrina happened to do a series about following one family. And at the time, I had a relationship with both CNN and NPR, but CNN not on the air. So I thought I could bring this idea to CNN, but they won't let me do it on the air because they haven't put me on the air yet. So, you know, I was like, you know what? I'll just bring it back to NPR. And I did it for NPR, won all these awards. And then the people at CNN were like, wait, why didn't he do this for us? And I said, why do you think? If you put me on the air, I would have won it for you. Boom, they gave me a shot on the air. So it's one of those times when awards, like in general, I don't take them that seriously, but they can be very pragmatic and useful in your career if you time them well. So it worked for me in that case. Yes. Before we get to CNN, because you did overlap, as you just Mm -hmm. intimated there, between NPR and CNN. But during this time in August of 2005, I just want to make Mm -hmm. a mention of the fact that you also somehow or another found the time to start your own business (laughs) called Magic (laughs) Proposals. Yeah. Just quickly, Josh, (laughs) what was Magic Proposals and why? Or I should say, what were the upsides and downsides of starting a business while you were a journalist? Right. So when I proposed to my wife, you know, I don't believe in having a big audience or whatever, but I had tricked her into ending up alone with me on the stage of the Fox Theater when the Fox Theater was empty. It's this gorgeous in Atlanta. In Atlanta. Yeah, most mm-hmm. beautiful theater I've ever seen. It has this sparkling sky. Basically, I got it on a night that it was dark. I had someone there. She thought we were taking a shortcut across the stage because I was going to do an interview. But then the spotlight came on, music played through the whole theater, whatever. It was wonderful. And then when we told people the story, there were a lot of guys saying that they wanted to do something like that. So I started helping guys do it. And at first, I was just helping them like organize things based on what she would like, what he wanted to express and about his own unique love. Anyway... Then at the time, I was also, yes, at NPR and starting to do some stuff for CNN. And I wasn't getting the shot on air yet at CNN. So I thought, okay, you know what? I'm just going to go in this other direction and start my own business, Magic Proposals. So I made a bunch of videos with these guys that I was helping. I launched the business. And the launch went well. There wasn't all this stuff about it on radio and TV. And some people started hiring me. And it was wonderful because I controlled it. And I got to make my own decisions. But... Right then is when that whole Hurricane Katrina, CNN opportunity thing happened. So I ended up having to make a choice because it was too much. I couldn't do everything. So one of the negatives was just that it was so unstable because it was my own. And the stability and the opportunity I had waiting for longer was at CNN. So I set it aside for that reason. But that said, having multiple dreams, having multiple options for yourself is so important. Don't ever limit yourself to just one. Absolutely. And I also think it's important to mention because I do think it's great within higher ed as a student because you can study whatever interests you. But the downside is that you end up becoming intellectually siloed and you tend to think of yourself as whatever. The comp lit major, my only options lie in teaching 
in becoming a book editor, you tend to think very linearly. And I think one of the wonderful things that people discover is that you can be an entrepreneur in pretty much any industry. You can have an entrepreneurial mindset. And I think we heard Josh talking about the entrepreneurial mindset he had at NPR, whether it was innovating a will follow a Hurricane Katrina survivor over a period of a couple of years, or I'll, and he's going to talk about it now, innovate a new beat at CNN. Yeah. You don't just have to be an entrepreneur in terms of running your own business. You can be in the driver's seat in an entrepreneurial way of your own professional journey. So interesting that you say that. I mean, now that you have me pause and think this through, there is a direct line between I have an idea for a children's musical. Now it exists to I'm going to show up in Atlanta and create a career to I'm going to show up at the public radio station and make something happen to I'm going to create this business. And as for everyone listening, you know, yeah, this is so important that you not silo yourself through your major. And one way to avoid doing that is to think of what you have to offer the entire world as a big collection of skills. And the skills that you have will most likely apply to any field. So as long as you recognize that you have skills and will keep building skills, you don't need to limit yourself at all to specific professions. A hundred percent. It's called transferable skills. And you will have them from the time you are in school throughout your professional journey. Don't allow yourself to be siloed in an industry or a company if you feel the itch to grow. Follow your instinct and your gut. So I know, Josh, you never applied to work at NPR or at CNN. So how did you get your foot in the door at CNN? When you and I first met, you were working at Wire CNN Mm -hmm. and people today have heard of Wire CNN, but I'm not sure if back when you and I met, it was as well known. They'd heard of the Associated Press, of Reuters, of Agence France Press. But Wire CNN was CNN's own version of a wire service. How did you start at CNN? Yeah, you know, this is really important, too, because people live in this era of social media, in which people think a lot about branding themselves. So what happened with me was I, I was all over the air on NPR. And this was basically through my 20s. And, you know, there's a lot of wonderful things that come from that. It has the biggest audience of anything in broadcast news, more than anything on TV, anything in radio. But it started to get to the point in my late 20s or around age 30, where I felt like it was invading my identity. I was starting to think of myself as Josh Lips, NPR News. And I was like, you're never your job. You, I don't care if you're the president. You are not your job. You are a human being. You are a homo sapien on this little tiny marble in the universe. And I was like, I need to drop off the air for a year. And I knew people at CNN. And I wanted to get involved in the newsroom making editorial decisions. And someone suggested to me, Wire CNN, because the way it worked there was if we at Wire CNN, this group of people, if we wrote a Wire story inside CNN, as soon as we published it, all of CNN's outlets in the world would start reporting it. It would immediately go to CNN International, CNN Domestic, CNN Espanol, CNN Radio.com. And it was far more powerful than any individual story I could do. But also, I wanted to disappear from the public airwaves for at least a year. So I got this opportunity and I was like, I'll try it. So at first, both places let me split my time doing both. I'm sorry, how did you get that opportunity at CNN? I'm sorry. So I, someone told me who was in charge. All these people at CNN had heard me on NPR. And so I contacted some of them whom I had met through a contact. And I said, hey, this is the kind of thing I want to do. I want to get involved in the newsroom, drop off in the air for a year. Two of them suggested Wire CNN. They had me call the person who oversaw it. I was fortunate. He had heard me on NPR. He was like, you want to drop off the air and come do this for a while? Yeah, I mean, I've heard your stuff. It's great. Come on in and meet with me. I met with him. He immediately said, well, do you want us to hire you? Do you want to? I said, well, I would want to do it as freelance to try it out. So I asked NPR for permission to go to half schedule with them. And I asked him for have two or three days a week. And everyone said yes. So again, you can create what you do. So I started doing NPR half the week and Wire CNN half the week. 
And I loved CNN so good. And I became like allergic to hearing myself on the radio because I knew in my instincts, I had to disappear for a year. I had to stop letting that invade my identity. Like I am this person who is on NPR. So then I just stopped with NPR and I started doing only wire CNN for a year. And I loved it. And so again, it was without applying because I was able to make the connection and start off as a freelancer and prove myself. And then they worked out a deal where once I wanted to do it full time, they said, okay, we'll bring you on and give you benefits and stuff. It reminds me, Josh, of what some actors go through when they feel they're typecast Mm -hmm. in a particular role and they have to push and fight and whatever to get that. Like, I'm not just a comedic actor. I can also be a dramatic performer. Give me that break. So this was your way of creating the break for yourself. And you're totally right about that because I remember when I started, there were some people at the desk who were like, oh, another broadcaster who thinks he can write. And then, but they didn't understand is I had had to work on writing in order to do NPR. Like I said, I got the toughest editor. So I came in with the writing skills. So then like they would give me the least important stories at first. And then when they were like, oh, he did well on this. Okay, let's give him something hard. And then they liked that too. So I had probably a harder, I know, not probably. I had a harder time at first proving that I could do this job than someone who would have come from like a small newspaper somewhere because they had all this writing experience that people could read. Fantastic. So how did you cups and ice your way from wire CNN (laughs) to getting your on-air break? Because that is not the usual path. I don't know if our Listeners may be majoring in broadcast journalism or journalism, but usually the path to getting on air, if you don't become a reporter in some no-name place, is becoming a producer. But it is not usual to go from wire CNN, maybe it is now, but it wasn't when I knew you back then. That was not the usual path. Right. Usually it's either as a producer or as a local station reporter. So you're right. It was unheard of. And people told me it wouldn't happen. And inside CNN, all these people were like, we only want... I mean, like, I got so much rejection. Once I did Wires for a year, I started wanting to do some on-air stuff. And that was when the rejection started. They're like, no, you're too real a journalist. No, we only want... You're too real a journalist? Is that literally what they said? Uh Uh-huh. Oh, yeah. No, I'm... And then there were these two people who told me, listen... There are capital T's and capital J's. Capital J's are journalists first. Capital T's are TV people first. They they said, and it was another executive too. He said, they're looking for pretty boys from entertainment shows. You come along as a journalist. This isn't for you. I mean, but but people have said that to me about NPR as well. Like, and the way I am, the rejection fueled me. But I will tell you, it got to me after a year. And I did. I went to a therapist and I was like feeling so down. And when I got in, my, my wife was like, you have to talk to someone. And because she, she was what? like, I'm sick of listening to you, dude. I'm sick or of this. Of you being sad or whatever. Yeah. yeah. No, I'm, I'm just kidding. I'm no, just kidding. Sure. No, no, no. <laughs> no. I know you're right, though. I mean, and so when I went there, he said, What's wrong? And it took me like five minutes to get it out. I sat there and I said, I'm a failure. I am a failure. And he was like, what? Because, <laughs> you know, he had heard and seen my work and he did. But then I said, like, this was the first time I had spent more than a year trying to make something happen. And looking back in the scope of things, what's a year? But at the time, it felt like a lot. So I, you know, I had just kept being told, no, 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 this isn't what we're looking for. Yeah, we're, they want like the pretty boys. They want like people who are going to take journalism less seriously. They want people who will do like, which by the way. I'm sorry, Andy Rooney. I'm sorry, Andy Rooney. And I know oh, our man. listeners. I mean, don't know your Andy. Your dad, Rooney. okay. He's okay, but my no, He's but journalist. I was gonna say my dad actually for years, years and years, probably to this day, and he's about to turn 83, had a chip on his shoulder because he wasn't the, you know, drop dead gorgeous uh, news person, right. anchor, whatever. And first of all, Josh, I mean, you're a good looking guy. I don't know what they're talking about. <laughs> With this like pretty boy. And it reminds me, Josh, of when I, after I came back from China, after I graduated from college and decided I wanted to be a journalist and I'd worked at a member station of NPR for six months, hustled my way to a job working for the all news radio station here in DC. And I too wanted to break into broadcast. And I went to see somebody who was an executive at 
public television. And he said to me, well, I guess you're, how, how do you, oh gosh, I can't believe I'm blanking on this. He said the most backhanded way of telling me I wasn't fucking ugly. Right. That was really what he said. Mm-hmm. And it so hurt mm-hmm. to have somebody judge me purely on my looks that I, I can't say it deterred me. I think it also fueled me. Me too. Well, that's, that's, that's something that makes you and me and uh, the listeners who have the potential to be this way successful. Look, by the way, thank you. But I mean, every, every actor has been told this too. I mean, like Tom Cruise was told he couldn't, he wasn't good looking enough to be on TV. I mean, so the idea of being told this is really more about the person saying it. And one thing I learned early on, and this is important for your listeners, is that it's, you have to understand and internalize this. No other human being will ever know what you're capable of. No one. You cannot count on other people to believe in you or your career trajectory. You have to know your instinct. You know what you're capable of. I had been told that my voice wouldn't work for NPR, that I was all over NPR. So even when they were saying this to me, I knew the people saying this to me had been told that and internalized it themselves. So it was more practical to me. I mean, I wasn't like, you know, so hurt in that sense. I was more like, I know I need to do this and they're not letting me. And that was when I thought, okay, you know what? I've tried for a year. I'm going to go do magic proposals. And I got the Katrina idea. And instead of bringing it to CNN, where they would have stolen it and had someone else do it on the air, I went and did it for NPR. And at the time, because I had switched to freelance for NPR, after I got this whole series, in order to be eligible for awards, they had this policy where they would not apply freelancers for awards. So I had to come up with the money myself, and it was expensive at the time, to submit my own reporting for those Murrow Awards. But I was like, if I win, maybe it'll help me. So I came up with the money. I applied. I ended up being the only person who won any awards for NPR that year. So it's a good thing I did this for them. They sent me all these gifts. They refunded me for the applications. And and that's when the whole thing happened at CNN with the boss saying, wait, why did he just win Murrow's for NPR when he could have won it for us? And then that's when we get to how I then made the jump because no one made that jump from wires to on air. And what happened was I heard that I had, I had a, a very high level contact at CNN who spoke about it in the morning meeting for the whole company. And that's when the head of the company said, why didn't he win it for us? And right after that, I messaged him and I said, you know why? Because you haven't put me on air. Please mute me. I got a five minute meeting with him that weekend. And then that meeting, which if you want me, I can tell you what happened. But that meeting changed everything. That meeting was the reason I got it. Five minutes, literally. So give us the high level takeaways from that meeting, because this is another cups and ice story. Lessons from being Jewish. When Pharaoh says he's going to let your people go, don't wait and let the bread rise. Just <laughs> leave, okay? You leave not to forever, doesn't matter. Leave. When I went into that meeting, I said, look, this is the thing. If I were on the air with you, I want to win these awards for you. I'm not asking to become a traditional correspondent. I watch the, uh, what we're doing. I want to create a position in which I jump on the air and fact check anything and everything all the time. Live guests were just on, here are the facts. Guests yesterday were on, here are the facts. The president spoke, someone from any party spoke. Let me just jump on and do these fact check things. And he said, okay, try it on the weekend. That was my Pharaoh moment. I wanted to get out of there as fast as possible before he could change his mind. So I said, thank you so much, gotta run. He said, oh, that's good because my car is outside. So it was great, I left. But let's think about what he said. He said, try it on the weekend. He didn't say do one story ever. He said, try it on the weekend. So I thought, okay, how can I maximize this? Well, the weekend is 48 hours long. We are programming from 5 a.m. Saturday until 11 p.m. Sunday. I can do it the whole weekend. But wait, we have international. On Fridays, it's already a weekend somewhere in the world. On Mondays, it's still weekend somewhere in the world. I'm going to do Friday through Monday and do as many stories as I can. I did more live shots on the weekend than any person did during the week. And when they saw that work and I didn't suck at it, and I said, I want to learn to do better and better and better, I turned that into my next career. So everyone get out those plastic red party cups (laughs) and put it on your head. Put that fucking plastic red hat on your head and maximize any opportunity you get. Oh my God. So you became the fact 
checker in chief who was working around the fucking clock, Josh. Yeah. And then once they saw that it worked, then they expanded me to the whole week. And then I, I worked it out so I didn't have to keep doing the wire stuff as well. So I was able to keep doing that and then turn it into something. And, and you know, we had this comedy show for a while. They featured me on that. Like I, I was able to turn it into something. And then it was very, as you know, very unstable place to work in TV news. But uh, during that time, I was making connections and building what is considered a brand for myself. And learning, learning. Were you doing that intentionally? Were you saying, I want to be the Josh Lebs fact checker in chief brand? At that time, I was because I started to see that when it came to fact checking, no one on air was doing it with the intensity that I was. But this is also, you know, just a broader thing about our culture. Like, I don't like live guests going on TV and lying all the time. I, I hate it with an active dispassion. So, yes, I wanted to. I wanted everyone in the network and in America to understand that the more you listen to me, the more facts you'll get, the more truth you'll get. Now, unfortunately, large numbers of Americans don't care about facts. But (laughs) for those who do, yes, I wanted to make sure that they knew that they could trust and listen to me. Were you working seven days a week? So this was really unhealthy. I ended up being asked to be on the air every day. And at the time, because of the way I had structured it without a contract, the more I worked, the more I got paid. And I didn't want a contract because I didn't want to become someone that could be sent all over the country at any time. I wanted to control my destiny and stay in Atlanta with my family as much as possible. So I had financial incentive to keep working, but I also became addicted. And at first, I was overworking until the whole gender equality fatherhood thing happened. And that snapped me out of it. So you talk about this all the time, how you ended up taking... Time Warner, the parent company of CNN, to court. You took legal action against them. Yeah. Actually, I don't know. Did you actually take them to court or did you, um, did you threaten to take them to court? Oh, threaten. You're right. So there's a different system. It's interesting. What I did was I filed an EEOC charge, which is called the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission. That is a legal action. I ended up looking into the technical terminology because it doesn't have to go through the court system. uh, It can, it's not what people think of traditionally as a lawsuit or going to court. But the way EEOC charges work is you file a charge, then there's all this back and forth. um, And it is, it does give you legal protection. And then it can ultimately move into the court system. In our case, they were freaked out enough and ended up changing their policies and making them better. So we didn't have to enter the court system. So, I'll rewind for a second here and set up this story because things are going great. Josh is burning the candle at both ends, is on the air all the time. But at one point in this hard-earned success story, you hit a brick wall. Your wife, Melanie, had been pregnant with your third child, with Abby, and she went into labor really early. What happened next? Yeah. So it was our third kid. And we had already figured out that I would be needed at home for caregiving when the baby was born. And CNN had this policy, which is on the one hand crazy, but on the other hand, sadly typical. Under the policies at the time, anyone could get 10 paid weeks after having a kid, except a biological father. So anyone else, a, a mother, someone who adopts like a surrogacy, anything. Were you under contract or were you still freelancing? I was an employee at that point, not with the limitations of a talent contract. Those talent contracts, as you know, are just filled with crazy riders that like remove a lot of your usual rights and freedoms. I was an an employee and there are legal protections against gender discrimination. And so I had gone to the company in advance and I said, this just doesn't make sense. 10 paid weeks for anyone except a dad who's having a baby the old fashioned way, like literally. And they said, that's so interesting. Put it in writing. And, and so I had, and then they told me it went to the top of Time Warner and then all the units were weighing in. So for your listeners, that would mean like DC Comics, like HBO. I mean, everything that was part of the, the Time Warner world. Somehow they couldn't decide or whatever. And then my wife had severe symptoms from preeclampsia and they needed to induce. So our daughter was going to be born at 35 weeks. And I messaged them from the hospital saying, hey, have you decided? Am I getting the 10 week? Because a, a typical dad could only get two weeks. Still no answer. 
11 days later, I'm home holding my four pound preemie, caring for my wife and my two boys, messaging work saying, am I coming back to work now? Or do I have the, the time anyone else would get? And that's when they said, no, I could not get the same leave that anyone else would get because I'm a biological father and they just don't. So that's when I end up taking legal action, filing a charge with the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission for gender discrimination. And the responses that came in from women and men were so overwhelming and positive when I announced it that all of a sudden it became this phenomenon that I hadn't expected. <laughs> you know, my, my one little family, our situation suddenly turned into literally an actual global issue with like news reporting all over the world. So suddenly I found myself the subject of the news, which was the opposite side from what you and I are used to. That must have been a scary decision on your part, Josh, because there you were. I know, was Melanie working at that point? No. Okay. She had a a part-time opportunity that she had to give up because of this. So no. Right. So you were the sole provider for your family Mm -hmm. and you decided to take a behemoth, Time Warner, to court to threaten them, right, with legal action because they wouldn't give you the same parental leave as pretty much everyone else. And then you went public with it. Was Mm -hmm. there any... I don't know, second guessing or concern that this could blow back against you? So I remember my attorney at the time said, so the thing is, people should know, most workers, and you should know this before you enter the workplace, most workers in America don't know that we even have rights. Most, most workers don't even think they have rights. So I learned facts. I'm really into facts. So I knew that legally, once you file EEOC, they're not allowed to punish you in the workplace or fire you for it. But as my attorney said, he said, it's illegal, but companies do it all the time. They could absolutely fire you. But I just remember thinking, when I graduated from college, what kind of a person did I decide I wanted to be? Who did I want to be? Did I want to be someone who would let fears about mortgage and health insurance overpower what matters most? Or did I want to be someone who would stand for what's right? And I knew that it was too late to help my family because it would take forever to have this legal battle. And I had to go back to work and leave my wife at, at home and all these things. But I knew that it mattered to other families. And when I announced it, all these men and women started calling me to tell me their heartbreaking stories of going through similar things. So I had so much feedback coming in about why it was a good thing to do that I didn't stop to second guess myself. So sure, there was fear. What if they fired me? But I also have this belief in America, not that America as a a government or institution will always do the right thing, but that within America, there are people who, if you do the right thing, they will stand by you. These individuals will stand by you. So I didn't feel alone in the world making that choice. So what happened? So I announced it and tons of publicity came in. And the publicity, as you know, matters a lot to these companies. I mean, front page of the New York Times, like they're talking about me on the Today Show, just all this stuff. And then I ended up getting a book deal. And so I ended up writing a book. So all these things started moving very quickly after that. But I will never get back the time that I lost in those initial weeks of my daughter's life. I'll never get back that time I lost. But I felt good about fighting the good fight for everyone. And so over time, the message, I think, became pretty clear to CNN Time Warner that they could not maintain these policies that stated that men could not have the same chance to do caregiving. And what I learned throughout all this, and this gets to something you said in the instruction about feminism, I never thought about the term feminism really, or it applied to me at all. But I was wondering, why do so many women's groups and famous women, like why were they contacting me and caring about this and giving statements to the media about me? And I came to understand what's happening in the workplace. This is what people need to have their eyes open to when they're going in. The modern workplace was designed in the Mad Men era. The concept of what work is, this idea that you go to a place in the morning and you're done in the evening and you go home. It was built for work-life balance with the balance being one person, the man does all the work, the other person, the woman does all the life. The entire work structures that we are in to this day were built on the assumption that one person will do all caregiving and stay home. The other person will go to an office. No one was prepared or updated the structures at work to make sure that men and women have equal opportunities to make their own choices. So it's only by having these legal battles and by scaring other companies, because there was all this reporting saying like, this was a shot across the bow, other companies would have to see it. So anyway, Time Warner ended up revolutionizing its policies, making it much, much better 
for men and for women, changing it so that we do. So men there to this day, last I heard, get, I think, six weeks of paid leave for caregiving. And anyway, they have advanced their system. So that changed what they're doing and what other companies are doing because of the news. And then when my book came out, it opened up opportunities for me to take that message everywhere. So I left CNN. Well, first, huge, huge congratulations to you. Talk about, characterize the impact this incredibly painful and challenging period in your personal and professional life has had on your life to date? Mm. Oh, interesting. It yet again showed me that you can take even bigger risks and fight the good fight and have it lead to something good. It showed me that fighting the good fight is worth it. And because it opened these opportunities to talk about these other issues, it allowed me to go from being a teller of other people's stories to a fighter for justice. So, you know, by leaving corporate media and writing a book and doing speeches and all, I have become someone who can actually be more of a truth teller than ever because I'm not worried about corporate forces having opinions about what I have to say or, oh, is he coming across as opinionated? I can now call out anyone's BS. It has career-wise, in terms of me and my life, it has freed me to have a career that I control and to never feel that my voice is limited or sold or crushed. And living a life in which I can have activism and work that I do and get paid for it is the best career imaginable for me. And where you can be active in your children's lives and have a relationship with your spouse. Incomparably better. And then when our daughter was little, my wife went to work full time. And I'm the one home when they get home from school. I go over their homework with them. Because I control my schedule, I can take time off and be with them and do things. And, you know, I travel to give speeches, but I've always limited that to maximum one week a month. And the rest of the time, I'm the one who's home more. And it is so fulfilling because I know when my kids grow up that their images of home, you know, it won't be so much about like who was at the performance, who was at the parent teacher night. It will be what was an average evening like. And knowing that I was here, that I was with them, that I was caring about them and having fun and relaxing and cuddling and, and being completely ridiculous dad. Those are the memories that I want them to have. And because I'm not overworking and because I managed to strike my own balance, I have that hope, that fulfillment and those deeper relationships. And you are modeling this for your two boys and your daughter, modeling what a modern family looks like. What advice do you have for our young listeners, Josh, mm. about how they can approach their professional journey post-grad and how they can prepare for that day if and when they decide they want to become parents, how to navigate work-life balance? What can they do now? So the first thing is I have this TEDx talk I gave years ago about achieving the impossible. That's what you were referring to with cups and ice. And the first thing I encourage you to do if you're in college, you're looking ahead to a career is to try to tune out all the noise and get in touch with your instinct. Animals like us, we have instincts that tell us what we need to do. And we have learned not to hear them. And your instincts are not based on societal limitations. So for example, when I hear someone say, oh, my dream is to be a Supreme Court justice, I'm always like, is it or is it that you know in your instincts that you need to be in a position of using your judgment to help guide society? There's so many places to do that. You know, people are like, oh, I want to be a Broadway star. Well, do you? What's wrong with like being on theater? I've seen better theater here in Atlanta or on the West End. So try not to get caught up in societal ideas of what's better or worse. And instead, really hear and feel your instincts. What inside do you know you need to do? Follow that path. So there's that in terms of, you know, guiding your overall career. And as for the second question you asked, gender equality, what you need to do is go into any workplace, but especially if you're looking to get married or not get married, have children or have someone you take care of, an elderly parent, anyone. One thing to look out for is which places support all people 
in their companies in having work-life balance? Is it a company in which only the women are able to, you know, get caregiving time and the men are not? Talk to people in the company about what it's really like. You know, Cheryl Sandberg is in my book. And she told me that she is, I guess, not, it's not there now, but, but she told me that at Facebook, she has women who say they want to work at Facebook because of Facebook's support for fatherhood. Now, that sounds complicated for a second. But if you think about it, it's savvy and brilliant because a place that supports men as fathers wants to genuinely give women an equal opportunity in the workplace. Otherwise, it's the assumption that women will do the caregiving, keep men in the office, send women home. Places that have men who are engaged in caregiving and have work-life balance are giving all people, especially women, greater opportunities for true advancement. So places that provide you real work-life balance will also be genuinely committed to diversity, equity, and inclusion. Those things are inseparable. They come together. And you want to talk to the people who work at a place about whether they truly have that or whether it's just lip service that the company claims to have that. Fantastic. Josh, I have two final T4C questions that I try to ask all of my guests. The first one is, if you could share a time in your professional life when you struggled, maybe you failed and you've alluded to and, and gone into detail about the biggest one, and that, that wasn't a failure, it was a challenge in terms of standing up to CNN and also the challenge of trying to get on air at CNN. But the most important thing here is how you persevered. And if there was a lesson you learned in the process, and it is fine if you want to say refer to minute 23 in the interview. (laughs) No, it's fine. It's great. You know, back at CNN, as you know very well, at the end of every calendar year, they would suddenly just like start firing people randomly. And I did have a difficult time in which I thought I was going to completely lose all my money. I had had this banner year. I was all over the air. I was doing all this stuff. And then they called me and they're like, yeah, we don't think we're going to budget for you next year. Boom. Now, I ended up being on the air anyway. But in that period of time, I was like devastated, partly because I was addicted to what I was doing. This was before I achieved real work-life balance. And also partly because financially, it was the biggest chunk of the money I was making. So I freaked out. And that's when I went back to that therapist I had seen years earlier when I felt like a failure. He said, you know, he asked me the best question. He said, let me ask you something. When you're on the air, are you fully in the moment? I said, yes. He said, when else are you fully in the moment? I paused and I went, oh my God, I'm addicted. That was when I realized we can become addicted to anything. And most of the time, addiction has to do with being able to be lost in a moment and not having the stresses and fears. So for me, that became the best learning opportunity because I realized that I had to get work-life balance. I had to improve my mindset. I had to change how I approach life. And I had to be present in moments in general. So that moment when I had that fear, which lasted like a month before I worked things out, that ended up being so wonderful. So I'll tell you, the toughest times can often turn out to be really powerful lessons if you let yourself learn. Absolutely. And move through the experience without numbing yourself. That's a big one. If you could go back to Yale and do it all over again, but based on the immense wisdom you have today, what advice would you give yourself, Josh? Mm. That's so interesting. I think about this. I think it would be this, that you have learned so much. But as you go forward, you're going to need to do two things at once. One is learn skills of the workplace, which are different from no matter what you've done, no matter how much you've learned. You'll have to, but also, there are some things that you will have to unlearn. And I did not realize that until I started my career. And when I was working with some of those early editors, I remember one of them said to me, she said, you know, you have been in academia for so long that your language is academic. And you have to set all that aside and try to talk like a real person in order to be it. And this was when I learned the skills of like, NPR is supposed to be the most intellectual news. And yet even there, I was taught, tell the news like you're talking to a third grader, because it's only then that you'll simplify it enough to make sure you understand it and everyone understands it. I did not realize when I was in college and graduating from college that there are some things you have to unlearn. You have to unlearn some expectations you have. You have to unlearn that hubris that tells you that you already know enough about certain things. And you have to unlearn any biases, not just racial or any of that stuff, but just perspectives because there are things you haven't heard or experienced or learned yet. I moved to the South 
partly to do that. There was a thinking about the South up in the North that I had experienced, which is, oh, the South is so backward and racist. Well, I moved down to Atlanta. It was the least racist place I had ever experienced. And the place I grew up was completely segregated in upstate New York. So there were things to unlearn. And I want people to graduate from college and go into the work world excited about the opportunity to simultaneously learn and unlearn. That is so wonderful. You've gained a lot. It's all been worth it. But now is a new beginning to do both. Oh my gosh, Josh, you are singing from the same songbook. I love it. (laughs) Josh, (laughs) Josh is the author of All In, How Our Work First Culture Fails Dads, Families, and Businesses, and How We Can Fix It Together. Josh, where else can our listeners find you? Go to my website, joshlebs.com, uh, J-O-S-H-L-E-B-S.com. Also, the main social media I use for all things professional is LinkedIn. And you're, uh, you're like a LinkedIn superstar. I mean, you actually are. You're one of the top things on my LinkedIn every day because your stuff is so engaging. But I am a big fan of LinkedIn because it, you can siphon it by field and location and all these other tools that no one else has. And as you enter the work world, folks, make sure your LinkedIn looks professional and interesting. And that is not a place for your silly nicknames and stuff. They don't believe it. (laughs) (laughs) Josh, I want to thank you so much for making Time for Coffee today with me and the Time for Coffee community. You are such a rock star. I am so proud to know you. And I have so much incredible admiration for the work that you've done and that you're continuing to do. Thank you so much. This is a fantastic interview. And I'll tell you and one thing, else, you know what this is like having been an interviewer for so long, getting used to being interviewed to this day can be a little tricky, but with you, 100% comfort. So thank you so much. Thanks so much for listening to this latest episode of t for c And if you're interested in learning more about my coaching services for confused college students and recent grads, feel free to check out the Time for coffee website under the coaching tab at time the number four coffee.org or text me at 202-236-5712 that's 202-236-5712